journey with Sai. Sai uh, simply can be put like this. S A I can be S A plus I. Okay, is it simple? S A plus I. What is this I? This I is nothing but the small I that <laughs> each one of us think we are. And what is this journey then? The journey is very simple. For for us to know that there is only Sai in all of creation, Sarva Rupa Dharam, right? He has assumed all the forms, and therefore, to experientially know that this small little I has to journey because it thinks it's separate, and therefore it has to journey and merge with Sa, S A. And what is Sa? Bhagwan says Sa means divinity. Sa means divinity, and therefore when the Little I merges into Sa, it becomes. I can't hear anybody. <laughs> when the little I merges with Sa, what does it spell? Sa. You see. So that's the journey with Sa. So what is Sa or divinity? Bhagwan even refers to the beautiful religion of Islam and says that they often greet each other with Salam. Yeah, Salam. So what is salam? Bhagwan explains salam. He said the sa in salam represents divinity. How? The journey of a devotee to dissolve in the divinity, and that journey is in four stages, four levels of liberation, as Swami would put it. That first sa is called sa lokyam, which means to live in the kingdom of God. The second sa, Bhagwan would say, is sa mipyam. That is. Not only are you living in the kingdom of God, but you also live in close proximity. You know, the kingdom can be big. The emperor may be in one palace, right? So you may be in the kingdom. Just as an example, you may be in a kingdom, but you may still not be with the king, right? So first level of liberation is to live in the kingdom of God. The second level is samipyam. That is, you get to directly serve that divinity, right? You not only live in the kingdom, you serve the divinity, which means you are in close proximity, nearness and dearness to God. The third level, Bhagwan says, is sarupyam. Sarupyam means to have the same form as divinity. Now, what form is this we are talking about? Does it mean we all grow hair like Swami and wear robes? No, this is the worst kind of interpretation of sarupyam. Sarupyam you will find ever in the entire creation. Okay, sarupyam doesn't mean this. What sarupyam really means is the devo the devotee who is dissolving in the divine is at such a stage now that there is very little of the small I left, and therefore their body is an expression of God's grace. How? In the form of love, in the form of compassion, in the form of integrity, in the form of patience. See, Swami had given in Prema Mahini six values, and he said. These are the six values that are associated directly with the divine, and therefore, while other values may change with time and circumstances, you know the values change across time. The value system which two generations before us they had has changed now. You see, so those are values that change, but there are six changeless values. What are they? First, daya, compassion. Second. Dakshinya mo, he says in Telugu, which means charitable nature, means willingness to contribute to others' life in a meaningful way, right? Then prema, love, that is to have genuine affection, selfless affection for everybody. This is not the prema, the absolute. Here, the value of love is having genuine affection for all beings. And then shama, Swami would emphasize this a lot for devotees. What is this shama? Shama means forbearance. Ability to forgive and also forbear, you see, and the and the fifth one is integrity and honesty, right? Integrity and honesty, and the last one is orpu, which means patience. Patience, you know, purity, patience, perseverance. Swami always says these are very important values for a devotee. So sarupyam means you don't struggle to practice them. These flow through you naturally. This is having the same form as God. You see, so that is sarupyam, and 
Sayujyam, the last level, means absolute complete merger in God. What does it mean? This little I that was journeying to God has now merged in God in such a way that there is no I left, there is only Sai left. There is no I left, there is only Sai left. This is the very purpose of the journey of life and this is the journey with Sai. You see, we are also fortunate to make this journey with divinity itself. And there is a beautiful story that is usually referred to called the story of a salt doll. Have you heard the story of the salt doll? So it seems there was a doll of salt that was animated, that was alive. Okay? And the salt wanted to know what the ocean is made of. This beautiful sea that we have here. Right? Imagine the salt doll walking on the surface paradise wanting to know what the ocean is made of. So the salt doll is walking and going slowly and then there were some people there so it asked them, do you know what the ocean is made of? And those people who are wise ones, they told the salt doll, there is only one way you can know what the ocean is made of. The salt doll is inquisitive. How? Walk into the ocean. Right? Only when you walk into the ocean, you will know what the ocean is made of. So the salt doll feels, okay, let me try this adventure and starts walking. First few steps, its legs start vanishing. As it is going deeper and deeper, slowly the knees, the thighs, the hips, the stomach, everything is vanishing. Why? Because the salt is dissolving in the ocean. You see? And what is the ocean made of? Salt. This is our journey. So as it walked deeper and deeper and deeper, the salt doll went in a quest to know what the ocean is, but realized what it is. It is verily the ocean. And therefore, the entire salt doll vanished into the ocean, inseparably. You see, this is Sayujyam, the final merger with God. And that is the final step. And Swami said, these are the four levels of the dissolution of the devotee in the divine. And Islam, the Sa means this. Then what is Lam? Lam represents that final merger. It's the culmination. So when, when they address each other, our Muslim brothers and sisters, when they address each other with Salam, what they are telling each other is this, that we have to dissolve this little I in divinity. Right? So, the theme for this entire retreat across regions have been integrated. So, we did predominantly Salokyam in Melbourne. We did Samipyam, that is how to be near and dear to God in Adelaide. Here is Sarupyam. And finally, tomorrow's retreat in Sydney would be Sayujyam. Right? So, not only will this session be complete in itself, but there is also a thread running across the sessions because it's all one unit of Swami, right? And therefore, whenever they release the videos, you must go and visit them because what was taught there, except for the introduction which is happening now, everything else will be different there, <laughs> right? So that will talk about how to live in the kingdom of God. The Adelaide session will be about how to achieve nearness and dearness to God. And today's session is about how to be, how to express the grace of God through us. How to be the vehicles of the grace of God. That is today's session here. Okay? Are you excited? Yes. There's a beautiful, uh, you know, housekeeping announcement that they made. They already onboarded you onto the flight. At the level of Sarupyam, the flight is already on the runway. <laughs> Sarupyam is getting the boarding pass and you are in the waiting area to enter the flight, right? The pilot of this flight is Swami. He is taking you. And Swami Pyam is, you go and sit in the flight. Saru Pyam is, it's tax, not just taxiing, but it is going to pick up speed, right? So I want you all to really be alert. Because it's going to pick up speed. And if you, if you are not alert, you may just drop off the flight. <laughs> okay? Seat belts not fastened. So, be alert. What is Sai? This is the journey with the pilot named Sai. This is a flight called Sai. What is Sai? 
Swami gives this beautiful definition of Sai in his discourse. He says, Sai means S, spiritual change, A, association change, and I, individual change. See, S for, can we repeat this? S, spiritual change. Spiritual change. A, association. association change. I, individual change. individual change. Right? In order to understand change, that is transformation, we first need to understand what are we transforming. Do you agree? If you have to change your clothes from white dress to the surface clothes to go to the surface paradise, you need to know what to change, right? If you change your specs, it's not going to work. <laughs> you need to change the clothes. So, which means you need to know what to change for it to work in that situation, right? So, in this journey with Sai, to understand what transformation process is, we need to understand the mechanics of life itself, right? So, we'll have a quick look into it. What each one of you have here are three wonderful aspects, right? You can look at either screen, screens, okay? The first aspect is called will. The first aspect is called will. Now, there is an illusion in human beings which Swami clarifies and says they think they have a will of their own. But we will do an exercise where you will understand this. Definitely you have a will, but just that it is not different from the divine will. The will that is there is only one. There is no his will and my will. There is only divine will. Why? Will is like electricity. Will is like electricity. Now the electricity can light up the lights, it can light up the audio system, it can light up the projectors that are projecting, you see, or the air conditioner. Electricity can light up different instruments, but electricity is it different? Is there a audio system electricity, light electricity, projector electricity, are there different electricities? No, no there is only one power, right? one electricity. In the same way, Will is like electricity, right? That will is used in order to convert a thought into action. All your life is about, you have thoughts that you try to fulfill in terms of action, right? For that without will, it will not happen. You are going to see this in practical, but just assimilate the theory a little bit now, okay? So, from the will, we come to the sphere of your mind. The will is not necessarily what you limit to your mind and we'll keep mind simple mind would be thoughts can you keep it there don't complicate the understanding of mind mind for now is simply thoughts as simple as that okay it will help you understand and there are four capacities of the mind what are the four capacities just random thoughts right now also while this is going on i'm sure there are random thoughts running just observe them Random thoughts that are running in your mind, that is called the manas or just random thoughts, okay? Then there is an aspect of your mind which is called chitta, which means a repository of memories. What does it do? When you have an experience in life, like right now, I hope you are listening to me. <laughs> if you are listening to me, those sounds are going into your, your ear, you are making something out of them and if you choose to remember them, that's your choice. If you choose to remember them, this will remain with you. But how does it remain with you? As an impression in your mind. A thought impression in your mind. Those thought impressions are called as chitta. Means it, ha it has the nature of memory. Right? And then there is a decision making aspect of your mind. Which is called buddhi. The buddhi decides, of course it decides what's right, what's wrong, what is good, what is bad. But more importantly, when it comes to action, it decides what action to take. Moment the buddhi decides, there is something that happens. What happens? The mind associates with the body to make the body function. Now, don't worry about this. You know, in India, they first teach you theory and then practicals. That's what we are doing here. But we'll get to the practicals. Okay? Just keep this in mind. The mind associates with the body and therefore body can move. Otherwise, body is inner. And when the mind associates with the body, it is called as ego. Please don't confuse when we say in this session ego, doesn't mean pride, arrogance, show off, not that. 
here it simply means mind associating with the body is that okay and that is called ahamkara in sanskrit okay and of course then you have the body that is actually the instrument to do actions simple great so now you look at this this is this can be looked at, at as three primary factors you have the power of involvement and you have the power to focus will power is the same it's like electricity right what is involvement we'll see this will stems from who you really are that's why i said your will and swami's will is not two different things it's like electricity will comes from where from who you really are but then that will as it moves towards an activity is clouded by your ideas of who you are or what others think you are you know people are all the time telling you who you are right or you have your own ideas of who you are right so all those ideas cloud the pure execution of the will and therefore will stems from who you really are and is often clouded by who you think you are or what others think about you okay and what is involvement then involvement is the shape taken by the shapeless mind mind is thoughts but actually mind has no shape but the moment there is a thought that you give attention to the mind takes the shape of the thought this is important to understand this is how your life is functioning right now and therefore when you understand how this functions you can make use of this to lead a fantastic life you see and therefore that's why we are spending some time on this so involvement means the shape taken by the mind which is otherwise shapeless okay and the third aspect which is when you actually come to doing something right whether it is preparing for your exams doing the work in your office or setting up the retreat uh, here whatever may be the work or playing a sport whatever work you may be doing focus is essential do you agree without focus can you achieve anything no so focus is essential what is focus focus is the ability to integrate will involvement and action you see if you are able to integrate the power electricity the decision the power to power your decision right you take that will mix it with the involvement that is your thought process that is happening and convert that into an action so when you integrate the will involvement and action you gain focus on what you want to do is this practical or not is it, or is it going above your head no once it happened uh, just an aside uh, we were in shanti bhavan and prashanti nilayam serving the guests who had come there so hospitality is very important for swami right so swami would always call the research scholars the phd scholars to serve the guests who are there okay and then so that the guests will say they ask you oh okay what are you doing so they will think we are like you know the people actually appointed there to serve them and we will say no we are doing phd in uh, cardiology or um, an mtech in computer science and they'll be like wow really there's a phd guy serving me food that's you know this swami is a beautiful master he knows how to do everything that's how swami would do right and one such occasion we were serving in shanti bhavan and suddenly one of our teachers in swami's university comes running to us and then he says swami has sent a message for you guys there is a very great intellectual who is coming to prashanti nilayam no name mentioned there is a very great intellectual coming to prashanti nilayam you guys have to put a drama in two days swami's instruction is the drama must go above his head <laughs> we actually received an instruction like this that intellectual was none other than ratan tata ji <laughs> the chairman of tata and sons and who was there in prashanti nilayam on 3rd of december 2009 and we were told this on 1st of december 2009 that we have to put up a drama swami's instructions put up a drama but you should go above his head he is a great intellectual <laughs> so i was i was just hoping this is not going about your head <laughs> this is not an instruction from swami to do this here 
Okay, so that's just an aside. <laughs> um, now let's come to this. We saw what psi is and we just had a quick peek into the mechanism of life itself. The three important components of will. What is it? Will. Involvement. Focus. Okay. So this again is from Swami's own discourse. Swami says the question today is how can spiritual transformation take place without changes at the individual and the social level? What is needed for us the salt dawn merging in the ocean is spiritual transformation. Sayujam. But what Swami is asking is, how is it possible if you don't make an individual transformation and a social transformation, an association change, you see? So we have to start with the I in the Sai. Right? So we start with the individual change. You see, in coffee, it's coffee break is over. But this is an experience which I had. So interestingly, after my 10th board exam, in India you have a 10th standard board. Is it similar here? Is the public exam 12th? Okay. Yeah, so India is following suit. Now they are removing the 10th and they are only having it 12th. <laughs> but in our time we were not so fortunate. We had 10th board and the 12th board. Uh, so the 10th board exam uh, tends to be strenuous because the children, uh, especially in a particular syllabus, which is called CBSE in India, Central Board, you don't actually give a public exam until 10. So first standard to ninth standard, you're just enjoying life and passing the school exam when you're happy. And suddenly there's a board exam. It's a lot of stress. So what happened for me particularly was after the 10th board exam, I had the first episode of what I didn't know then was migraine. Okay, a severe attack of migraine. I used to get it predominantly on my left side, sometimes on the right side. So, and I had no idea what to do. I didn't know it was migraine. And after my 10th, I joined Swami's school in Prashanti. So, this was a problem, ongoing problem. It took me a couple of years when I saw a newspaper article, I realized that what I'm having is migraine. Then I told my parents I'm actually having this problem. They took me to all the best doctors. They were at Hyderabad. So, in Hyderabad, they took me to the Apollo clinic, which is supposed to be the best. All of that they did. No solution. No respite. Right? So once I had an opportunity to ask Swami, it became so intense. It was already five years into having regular episodes of migraine. And after that, I had to tell Swami. I said, Swami, I keep getting one-sided headache. Swami said, Chattanu Chattanu. I will tell, I will tell. What does it mean? that you have to wait whenever Swami, that's what I assume. So I said, okay, I'll wait for whenever Swami has to tell. Just continued with this. So patience and perseverance is very important in this journey. So that went on and it was a difficult experience because when you have migraine, light, sound, smell affects you severely. And our hostel has only that. <laughs> right? If you don't have a separate room. See, this is Swami's special arrangement for sadhana. So, and that is, it's really important in life to have that rigor. So, Swami's arrangement is, there are 14 or at least 10 brothers in my room, okay, from different parts of India, different mindsets, and obviously they'll be talking around, and then light will not go up because they have to study, so there's no isolated room for me, and then the kitchen is always giving you beautiful fragrances of the next session. I hope it doesn't come and distract you now. <laughs> but then, in hostel it used to happen. Brother, Sajar, brother is here from hostel. You know that just before the lunch, just before the dinner, ah, the whole hostel, you, you don't need to read the menu board. You can just smell like that and tell, ah, okay, today we have chola vatura, today we have <laughs> uh, dahi vada, whatever, you know. You would know what is there, biryani. <laughs> so, so smell. So all these were constantly there. And Swami simply said, Chaptanu, Chaptanu, which means I will tell you, I will tell you. So I left it there. Fast forward, 1999, I had the first episode of this one. 2007, eight years hence, Swami takes me to Chennai for the Atirudra Mahayagna. Swami selected five speakers and three singers, one tablist and one flautist. Right? So we were 10 and three boys who were serving Swami, that is who would push Swami's chair. And so we were 13 of us who were selected for the Chennai Atirudra Mahayagna. 
So, one session we were having with Swami. Swami was seated. I'm going to give you a bad news. <laughs> so, please tighten your seat belts. <laughs> so, um, one session Swami was seated on his uh, chair uh, on the over the dining table, and the food session was over. And suddenly Swami said this. Do you know? Here is coming the bomb. Do you know? One cup of wine is better than one cup of coffee. <laughs> huh? One cup of wine is better than one cup of coffee. Swami says you should not have alcohol at all. Alcohol is not good at all. You should not touch alcohol as devotees of God. Then, cup is worse than that. He said. <laughs> coffee is worse than that. How is it worse? Then Swami explained. He said, when you have alcohol, because of its nature, it at least destroys. Swami used the word purugulu, which means worms or you know tiny insects and you know the unnecessary material in the stomach. If you drink because of the nature of the alcohol, it will break them down and therefore they will die. He said, you should not have alcohol, but if you have alcohol, at least it cleans up your stomach. Coffee doesn't even do that. <laughs> this is how Swami said. Coffee doesn't even do that. And Professor Anil Kumar, Swami's translator, was petrified <laughs> because he can't start his day without a cup of coffee. So he was like, Swami, I can't start my day without a cup of coffee. What are you saying? And Swami said, Ah, I know that. Who who do you think kept the coffee machine out there? See, Swami is so compassionate, right? He said, who do you think kept the coffee? There was a coffee machine. Basically, we were staying in one room. There is Swami's room. There is a corridor connecting the two. Okay. So, in the corridor, there was a coffee machine. This is in Sundaram in Chennai. Swami's residence in Chennai. Sundaram. So, <laughs> so Swami said, that coffee machine, I had asked them to put there. Why? Because I know your day doesn't start without coffee. <laughs> then he gave a sigh of relief. That, okay, there is a respite from here. And Swami went on to say, tea, coffee, rendu, okate. Tea and coffee both are same. Then he further explained about milk. He said, milk also you must be careful. Why? Because nowadays they give injections to the cow in order to, you know, secrete more hormones and, you know, increase the size of the udder. That is such a torture to the cow. Just to yield more milk. Then Swami pointed out, this is 2007, he said, uh, see, uh, nowadays in US, in the in the America, there is mad cow disease. People are having mad cow disease because of these bad practices, he said. So we all heard it. Okay. <laughs> so now what to do? So I used to love coffee. I'm sure there are many brothers and sisters to give me company here. <laughs> right? So, and with migraine, it becomes even more easier. Every time you have a headache, you know what to reach out for. <laughs> It's a cup of coffee, right? And that was something I consistently did. After Swami said this, see, this is how we do individual change. The story is about individual change, transformation. So, what I did was, okay, Swami said, don't have coffee, it's not good for health. So, from today onwards, I'm not going to have coffee every day. I will be a social drinker of coffee. <laughs> Which means, if my friends come and invite me for a cup of coffee, <laughs> Then I will have, otherwise I won't have. <laughs> Social drinker of coffee. You know what the way God works, the way he, Swami says, test is my taste. You know what happened after I thought like that? Every day somebody would come and invite me. Before it never happened. Before there would be few classmates who would randomly choose to have coffee. But after I decided this, every day somebody would come morning and evening. Right? And I was actually having more coffee than usual. Then my ignorance came to my head. What was my ignorance? I thought cappuccino is not coffee. <laughs> I mean, if it's coffee, they should have still retained the name coffee, right? <laughs> so I thought cappuccino is not coffee, especially because in Parthi kiosk, in Prashantinilliam kiosk, when you go and have cappuccino, they sprinkle chocolate powder on top. So I thought it's actually chocolate and maybe a little bit of coffee. So I decided, no, I must follow Swami's teachings. I am not going to be a social drinker of coffee anymore. I will become a social drinker of cappuccino. <laughs> and that went on for a long time and I was 
totally convinced this is the right thing to do. You see, fast forward few months, my sister, my cousin, she was getting married and as a brother, I had duty to perform in the marriage. So I went there and I was doing my duties. There was a mentor that their family had who was an ardent devotee of Swami, but he was also a healer, a cosmic healer. So he would like, you know, uh, if you give him your photo or a name, you know, there are people like that who would just, uh, he, when he is not somebody who would make money or publicity out of it. He would do it as a seva. Only those who reach out to him. He was a very nice man. So when I went there, that is satsang for me, means his experiences with Swami. So I sat with him in satsang, listening to his experiences with Swami. And whenever they would call me to do duty, I'd say, just one minute, sir, and run there and do my duty and come back. So my parents were really worried because no amount of medical intervention helped migraine. So they asked this gentleman, this devotee of Swami, um, sir, can you help with this? Because all traditional modalities, um, uh, Ayurveda, allopathy, nothing worked. So let's try this. So they went and told him, can you help my son? He has severe attacks of migraine. And you know he's studying, which means it affects his studies and all that. Uh, so this healer, he just looked at me top to toe and he asked me a question. Do you know why you have migraine? I told him, no sir, I don't know why I have migraine. He then said, please listen to this carefully. He then said, you don't have faith in Swami. That is why you have migraine. Thankfully, Swami's own samskara, auntie spoke beautifully about samskara, Tarukha. Swami's samskaras came to my help, being his student. And I didn't feel offended by, oh, how can you say I don't have it? No, I just felt that. I told him this. I said, Sir, I know Swami is God. Can you please explain to me what is it that you mean to say? What is it that you want to communicate to me? He became so happy. See, this is what we must do as devotees of Swami. So we must not get agitated as Auntie was mentioning. Right? It's important to communicate like a devotee. When they see you, they must know ah, this must be Swami's devotee or this must be Swami's devotee. And that day, I was happy that uh, that brother gave that acknowledgement and he said, um, he said, now I'm happy. You didn't take it in the wrong way and you have asked the question, how do I know what really faith means? Right? He then told me, I am not going to tell you, you will figure it out yourself. This is what he told me. I'm not going to tell you, you will figure it out yourself. So, I went back to Prati. And in the department of chemistry where I did my PhD, uh, there was a conference and I was taking care of logistics. And I just finished uh, some transportation related uh, assignment and I was walking back into the college campus. And guess what? The next session is coffee session. And the entire table, because they were running short of time, the entire table was filled with coffee, guru coffee made in India, right? It was entirely filled. They had poured in the cups and kept because in a minute the session was about to close and they didn't want people to waste time. It will still be hot. So they, they were just pouring into those glasses. 50 cups of freshly brewed coffee. Hot, hot. You know what? The fragrance of that was wafting with the air. And I just entered the campus and you see those cartoon characters when they smell food. They go tiptoeing like that. I was literally like that. Ah, oh, coffee. And I went there to the table and I pick up a cup of coffee. I am allowed because I am in the organizing team. So <laughs> I pick up a cup of coffee to drink and inner voice, an inner voice tells me, can you put this cup of coffee down, not because it is bad for your health, but because Swami said so. Can you imagine that this is the voice that came and I don't know what happened. There was a gush of energy. I kept that cup of coffee down that day. That day till now, I have not touched a cup of coffee. The host will know. <laughs> I'm troubling them a lot. Uh, I've not touched a cup of coffee. Migraine has not touched me from that day. This is 2008 and now we are in 2022. 
so when you implicitly obey god the will that is actually his power there is only one will that is swami's will that power can be garnered to make any transformation the only thing that you need to do is make a absolute conscious choice that i am going to change this habit you see this is the individual change that swami wants so i am going to go to swami's quote because we need to know what swami wants right so this is from swami's discourse and he says there are some bad habits among individuals such as smoking drinking liquor meat eating and gambling these bad habits not only degrade the individuals but also inflict hardships on their families these bad habits have to be given up for the individual to manifest his inner goodness you see we are talking about this whole session is about manifesting the grace of god through us and how will the first step individual change these bad habits have to be given up for the individual to manifest his or her inherent goodness one's personality can blossom only when one leads a moral life you see this is swami's expectation so the story communicates faith in swami is not merely to believe oh he's god so i can ask him for anything no faith really means implicit obedience to god and for individual transformation this is the guidance given by god yes so i'm going to do an exercise which i promised you so that the entire idea of how this will gets translated into action is understood by all of you i've done we have done this exercise earlier with the other groups but it's worth repeat, repeating here because here the focus is on the will so i request all of you to sit straight please and it's not without reason see one day swami came out in the kulvant hall and you know when when swami is inside the interview room all of us are like this right and then you hear that sound the of the latch opening now those of you who have been in parthi those days you would know the tuck when sound will come the swami's latch opens and there's pin drop silence and only that sound resonates from the interview room all the way to the end of kulvant hall and everybody becomes alert because swami is coming out right so then swami comes out so all those who are like this they become like this then swami comes out and stands in front of the students and starts talking this actually happened so swami is speaking to the students so students who are like this listening to swami after 5 minutes 5 degrees after 10 minutes 25 degrees after 20 minutes 45 degrees you see it's not linear <laughs> it goes like that so swami after a while was noticing all the boys who were sitting straight with their spine erect they are like this in front of him so he said hey boys sit straight so we all sat straight and then he made a beautiful remark he said see at this age if you sit in this incline can you all see this yeah. at this age if you sit in this incline when you grow really old you become like this he said what is this this is a question mark at the end of your life you will wonder what did i do with this life really such a great blessing of human life what did i really do your life ends up being a question mark but if you sit with your spine straight if you sit with your spine straight this becomes an exclamation mark at the end of your life you say wow what a beautiful life i lived so you see what you want is your choice so please make the right choices so sitting straight is very important in your day to day practice young children if they are here it will help you in your school it will help you in your concentration and for everybody else in whatever you want to do if you want to study you want to learn you want to practice you want to do your sadhana first thing is to set your posture right doctors ergonomists will also tell you you need to set your posture right right so this is the first thing. now we are going to do an exercise all of you your predominant hands up please right or left whatever it is whatever is your predominant no sore paw here really okay <laughs> fine so now place your hand on your thigh okay simple exercise i want you to think 
only think lift my right hand <coughs> only think lift my right hand and observe your right hand no no need to see with the eyes you just know no whether it's moving or not just observe your right hand is it moving please respond no no now think intensely lift my right hand think intensely lift my right hand and observe your right hand is it moving no no very good. this is experiment 1 please note your observations experiment 2 when i say 3 2 1 as soon as you hear one just lift your right hand is it okay ready 3 2 1 fantastic please hold your hand and look around look around everybody just see everybody else who is there wonderful please raise your hands down thank you now this was experiment 2 please note your observations experiment 3 when i say 3 2 1 you decide whether you want to lift your hand or not is it fair okay ready 3 2 1 okay those who lift their hand be there now just look around everybody please look around if you can't see back you have neck issues please get up and turn it's important to look around yeah you observe this great hands down thank you for what is telling so now you tell me what is your inference from experiment 1 2 and 3 you can go one by one if you want but tell me your inference anybody when we wanted to lift the hand we lift that is the second experiment the last the last one oh means last one you are saying you you wanted and therefore you lifted yeah Sorry. what about the first two the first one there was an urge to lift but we did why i think because we strongly thought you thought there was a strong thought huh. to lift your hand okay this important observation you thought strongly but still the hand did not move yeah everybody agrees is it your experience as well great that's experiment one Experiment two. Brother spoke of experiment three. Experiment two, the back benchers. You asked us to. Ah, because I asked. All the way, this guy has come from Russia. <laughs> <laughs> One thing he said: Let us just do it. <laughs> so you lifted your hand. Very good. So you see, the first experiment showed you. I'm just debriefing quickly for the want of time. the first experiment showed you that a thought alone did not translate into action do you agree yes. merely having even a strong thought in the mind did not translate into action second experiment when i said when i requested you hear 3 2 1 lift your right hand what did it out of your immense compassion see already you are manifesting divine grace in the form of compassion So you say, Papa, poor fellow. So let's lift when he says one, and you all lifted your hand, right? You decided to lift, and therefore you lifted. When you were lifting your hand, was there any thought? Did you observe? You can try now also. There's no thought, right? And in the third experiment, what happened? When I said three, two, one, did everybody lift their hand? Some chose to lift, lift, and some chose not to. which means what there is a decision that you made in experiment 2 and 3 the decision you took in experiment 2 was let's follow this brother experiment 3 the decision was your choice some of you decided to follow some of you decided not to follow follow in sense lift or not lift your hand right so you see a thought alone cannot translate into action is this clear to you A, even a strong thought cannot translate into action unless there is a decision that is taken by you that decision is the intellect's work that is buddhi or intellect when the decision is taken the power of the will that is electricity is connected to the mind the power of the will is connected to the mind then the mind connects to the body mind connects to the body and then action happens you see when there was just thought we said what is mind what is mind thoughts 
when there was just thought nothing happened but when the power of will combined with the thought thought combined with the body action happened do you agree yeah. right this is called ahankara not pride ego that's a different context in a practical mechanic mechanics of life context this is ahankara ahankara means where the mind joins with the body ego the mind joins with the body and it makes how just like a pair of gloves you have a pair of gloves they are there will they move on their own imagine if they move on their own <laughs> how spooky will be that fingers into them and move them the gloves will start moving right so in the same way the body is like the gloves the pair of gloves and the mind is like your hand so it's only when the mind associates with the body that movement happens you see this is how life works and therefore we are talking about integrating the will the involvement which is the mind and focus which is integrating that with the action if what we discussed before in theory is it clear now yes. do you agree the will the divine will or the individual will electricity is only one is there a bulb electricity and a projector electricity that separate yeah. this piece of lighting is so big projector is smaller mic is even more smaller so is the electricity changing its nature because of the size of the instrument electricity is only one in the same way the will is only one right um, we don't have time but if you do this exercise on your own pay attention to the point before the decision making you will understand what this will is right little need more time but you can try it now we are going to do a simple affirmation process this affirmation process is to purify the involvement section see i am let me just go back to that slide and explain does this come out yeah great so if you look at this this is where the problem is for everybody right because you have past memories that are clouding you the vasanas from previous births possibly all of those are clouding your decision making process you see so what is needed for the will which is divine to fully express through action is this section called involvement to be transparent do you agree if the will was sun and the body and the action was your home for the sunlight to come fully into your home which is the body and the action the window has to be open do you agree yes. if there are layerings in the window like you have a grill then you have the glass then you have the light curtain then you have the thicker curtain all of this closed will any sunlight come through this is the life of a human being who is not able to express divinity through them so what should one do very simple open up the curtains open up the windows open up everything allow transparency to flow right once you make your mind pure what it means is once you make your mind pure not cluttered with thoughts then what happens the divine will flows through you naturally this is the end goal of the session today okay so what we are going to do now is a process which will cleanse the mind this involvement section it will cleanse what does cleansing mean cleansing basically means first it will replace negative attitudes and tendencies with positive attitudes and tendencies that is the first level of cleansing the highest level of cleansing is to remove all activities of mind that is to cleanse thoughts itself but we'll get there first level is to replace negative attitudes with positive ones here is a simple um affirmation that swami himself has prescribed right and we will do this mind and breath are integrated and swami always would tell us that even when you do so hum right along with the breath you need to do so hum you see because the mind and breath are integrated so when you use the breath for your affirmation work it works much better okay so we will do that now what are we doing first we will take only two out of the four sentences you see there you breathe out always start breathing out 
you breathe out saying i am not an animal and you breathe in saying i am a human being this is the first level of individual transformation shall we start okay breathe out i am not an animal breathe in i am a human being breathe out i am not an animal breathe in i am a human being breathe out i am not an animal breathe in i am a human being breathe out i am not an animal breathe in i am a human being but be there just be with this stay we now advance this affirmation breathe out i am not just a human being breathe in i am divine breathe out i am not just a human being breathe in i am divine breathe out i am not just a human being breathe in i am divine breathe out as you breathe out i am not just a human being so the idea of being limited as a human being is going out of your system breathe in i am divine the uh, truth that you are divine is being affirmed by you right breathe out i am not just a human being breathe in i am divine yeah. sit silently in this thought i am divine simply sit if you feel like if your mind is running then you can just repeat i am divine i am divine How did that feel? Some feedback. Peaceful. Peaceful. So this simple affirmation of Swami will help you replace the negative tendencies. When you breathe out, "I'm not an animal" to begin with, you can hold this intention that all animal qualities. This is negative quality. What are they? Anger. 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 Hatred. only the negatives right animals have beautiful qualities also loyalty and all that but you all the anger hatred the six enemies kama krodha loba moha means desire to procreate desire for material then lust anger hatred jealousy greed pride all these just hold one in, intention that when you say I am not an animal and breathe out all these are leaving you and when you breathe in and say I am a human being all human virtues the six human virtues we discussed they are all getting imbibed in your mind simple right we won't elaborate much on this now but that is just to give you a hint and you can practice this more and more and we we'll see that. the second level would be to breathe out I am not just a human being and you breathe in i am divine and you finally stay with i am divine just simply sit silently in that reverberation of i am divine if you find the mind still running you can keep repeating like a mantra i am divine i am divine i am divine is it okay one we now move to the next change which is association change right this is very important this association change has two dimensions to it one is the inner dimension of association the other is the outer dimension of association we will first look at the inner dimension of association this is a beautiful thing that happened sorry 
So this happened in Kodaikanal when we were with Swami. Uh, maybe a little prelude before that would be 2007 in Chennai when we were with Swami. You know, trips with Swami is very exciting because as a student, you hear from others who have been to other Kodai sessions and, and all about what Swami does in those tours, and then you start making checklists. Oh, so students who go with Swami, they fly in the plane with Swami. They have food with Swami. Swami gives them gifts. Swami gives them some money and asks them to go for shopping. So there's there's a huge list that we make. I'm, I'm sure brother resonates with that. So there are only few boys who will get to go with Swami. Actually, the rest of us keep making lists of what it would be like to go with Swami, right? So when the Chennai uh, trip happened with Swami in 2007. I was there with all my checklists ready, so I was like, oh, okay, this is not Kodai, it's Chennai, but still the checklist is valid. So one by one we were taking. First, the vehicle came and picked us up from our hostel to the Prashanti Airport. Tick, right? Then in the airport they gave us very good food. Tick. Then we got into the airplane and we waited for Swami to enter the airplane. Tick, right? Then we took a photo with Swami in the airplane. Tick, and we had a, a meal with Swami. in the air tick so like this you know there's so many the list never ends because swami only knows how to give give and give he doesn't know how to take because he knows only to give give and give our list is very long <laughs> you see so it so happened in in chennai unfortunately this happened to me and i have to tell you openly because it could resonate with you so what i did was though i was with swami and i was enjoying the spiritual fervor of that um at the same time my checklist was also important because that was the first ever trip and i was like oh wow i was wondering how will swami send us for shopping in chennai right it's such a big city kodaikanal is nice and cute you know and so shopping makes sense but how in chennai you know what i just thought about this that day swami calls all of us he gives us money and says go and do shopping i was like shocked i said i was just thinking about this swami but where are you sending us for shopping you know what he did he sent us to spencer plaza and mount road those of you who have been in chennai you know spencer plaza and mount road okay that is one of the oldest shops in chennai it's now become a mall swami sent us that you all go there so we are the only ones with white and white and hawaii chappals in the mall okay. so we went there and we did the shopping and we came back we you know as always we show it to swami and swami will comment something nice all that happened one day swami called all of us now it was the time the shopping is done next checklist is gifts okay it didn't happen till then so i think okay shopping is done what about gifts so swami calls one day into his room so there is swami's bedroom and outside if you go to sundaram now in chennai they allow you to actually have the darshan of swami so where he was so it's a nice thing if you go there please do Uh, so, just outside Swami's bedroom is Swami's interview room kind of thing. That's where we used to sit with Swami. So Swami sat there and called all of us, and he told one of the brothers inside his room to bring suitcases. And you know what? He brought huge suitcases. Like he was struggling to pull them out. So wow, what gifts might be there in it? <laughs> you know? So they came out, and Swami said. open chai open them you know he created that suspense it's such big boxes and all that and when it came they opened it and you know what was there in that this is 2007 already digital age and in that the real cameras were there you know the ones we used in 1997 not 2007 in india here maybe 97 itself you had digital i don't know but in india we still use those you know we put the real and then you click photos that one so all the excitement i had was uh, okay so swami knows everything so first he gave each one of us with his own hand he gave the camera so we received uh, okay so swami why all this one airport would have sufficed instead of all these gifts a small airport you know these kind of thoughts come to you and uh, and swami you know the way he does it is amazing the way he teaches you a lesson so he give he gave all of this he knows what's going on in our head and then he tells the brother who opened the suitcases open the other one which could have more gifts when he opened you know what was there there the whole thing was loaded with reels for this camera 
<laughs> so he said, no, see, there are so many, they have to take so many photos, you fill their hands with this, he said. So, you know, they literally like this, they picked up those reels and put it on us. And we are holding the reels like this with one camera. We were like, oh God, we already had DSLR camera to shoot Swami by then. <laughs> and then we were wondering, oh God, what to do with this? And Swami gave instructions. He said, see, pitchy pitchy photo theodu. Don't take bad, mad photos. Only if you take either nature photos, Swami photos. You know, Swami said that. We were not actually going to use the camera anyway. <laughs> so, that was the thought process, monkey mind. So, that happened. Then, fast forward from there to Kodaikanal. By the end of the Chennai trip, I already realized that half my Chennai trip I wasted like this. So, I literally prayed to Swami, Swami, please take me to Kodai somehow. I will not do the mistakes I did in Chennai. I was pleading with him. He was compassionate and he had. Swami had put my name in the Kodai list and that year I went to Kodai. In Kodai, one fine day Swami comes out, the same cameras come out <laughs> and he tells them distribute. While they were distributing, Swami suddenly stopped the boys who were distributing and said, hey, these boys who are sitting here, don't give them. They don't want it. He said, these boys, he pointed to me and few of us from Chennai, trip. He said, these boys, don't give them. They don't want it. <laughs> so they distributed to everybody. After the distribution was over, then came the real gift of Kodai. The real gift of a Kodai trip for a student, brother will know, is the Kodai watch. Means, the Kodai watch is so special. Means, Swami will select a particular watch and he will give every student who made it to the trip that, that watch. All the devotees, VIP, seniors, students, everybody will get. You can so much as if you are in Prashanti and you see a particular watch, the students will know which year you went to Kodai. So that's how specific, unique and important the Kodai watch was. You see? And then Swami came up with the watch and he was marketing it himself. He got the watch out and he said, Boys, do you see this watch? He showed the watch and he said, Do you see this watch? We all are looking at it like that, like a candy, like how baby looks at the candy. We are looking at it like that and the Swami said, see, this is a very good watch. This watch is made of gold, see, golden watch. And inside that, Swami is there. So in the, in the dial of that watch, Swami was there. Then he asked, who wants this watch? So all of us, see, Swami is marketing a product. <laughs> what do you expect? So all of us said, Swami, we all want this. Swami came. With his own hands, he gave everybody that watch. When he came to me, he skipped me. He didn't give it to me. <laughs> Poor thing. I am at least okay. I know why he is not giving it to me. But there were three guys behind me who also didn't get it. And they didn't come to Chennai. So, Sangha Dosha, they say. You know, the, the defect of such Sangha. Not Dush Sangha. <laughs> Bad company. So, as a result, those three, four boys didn't get the watch from Swami. And as I was actually feeling bad for them because I know what's happening to me. This was my test and I had to pass it. So, I was very clear. I said, no, Swami, I don't want your watch. You keep it. I want you. I was very clear. I said, you keep the watch. I want you. I know this is your test. I don't want the watch. If you don't give, it's okay. Right? But then what about those three boys behind me? What did they do? They were sitting near me. That was their problem. So, so then it went he gave watches to everybody over. Swami sent back whatever extra watches were there. So we thought it is done. One day, two days, three days. After three days, it was my chance to do Pada Seva of Swami. That is, you massage, you get the chance to massage Swami's feet. It's not that he needs so much massage, but he allows us to do <laughs> out of his love. So we have, I was massaging, and when you massage Swami's feet, uh, you can't look up at him. Because you are right up and close, right? You are holding his feet. Sometimes Swami's feet will be on your lap. So, you can't look up at Swami. Because it will be like staring into his face. And he is talking to others. So, we look down and we massage. That's the etiquette of massaging Bhagwan. So, when we were mas when I was massaging like this, suddenly I hear a sound. A. Hey. You know the Swami's bass voice, river. A. Hey. You know, I feel the whole world wakes up with that. <laughs> said, hey. So I just looked up. Watch Ochinda. 
He says, after three days, did you get watch? I said, Swami. Then he repeats, did Swami give you a watch? He says, so I said, uh, Swami, you gave it to me when I was in my 11th standard. Because there was a prize distribution and Swami had given. I said, Swami, you gave it to me in my 11th standard. Then Swami says, is it here? Do you have it here? I said, no, Swami, it's not here. <laughs> and then he said, watch Leda. You don't have watch, is it? He said, no, Swami. Ayo, Pabam. <laughs> so sad. You don't have watch, is it? Then he called one teacher and said, get the watch. Okay, so he got this watch. And look at the master's glory. He takes a piece of an ordinary material in the world. You know, millions of these boxes are there in the world. He takes this and he, he tells us, do you know what this is? Look at this, it's a beautiful box. This is a 2007 box, still intact, perfect. Whatever Swami's words are in it, because he held this and he said these words. So he said, look at this beautiful box, strong box, isn't it? He said, yes, Swami. Then he opened it and showed. He said, inside the strong, strong box is a transparent cover. Do you see? He said, he said, yes, Swami, we see, it's beautiful. Inside that is the golden watch. And inside the golden watch is Swami. He showed in, in the dial, there is Swami's uh, photo. He showed that inside that golden watch, there is Swami. Now he asks us, now you tell me, do you want the box which is beautiful and strong? Great it is, but do you want the bo box? Do you want the transparent cover inside the box? Or do you want the watch? Swami asked this question. So we said, Swami, the watch with Swami in it. Right? Then he explained, see, like this, like this outer cover, a beautiful strong outer cover. I have given a beautiful body, strong bodies to all of you. Inside your body, there is pure transparent mind. When I gave it to you, it was pure. I don't know what you did with it. <laughs> that was pure transparent mind, which is this. Inside that, if you go deeper into that, you will find the golden heart, which is this watch. Inside the golden heart, you have Swami Himself residing. While you must take care of your body, and ensure it's healthy because it's God's gift. You must keep your mind clean and pure, again, because that's how He gave it to you. But most importantly, your association or your attention must be in your heart. Don't give too much attention to your body. Don't give too much attention to your mind. Give the necessary attention to them, but your entire attention should be in your golden heart in which Swami Himself resides here. He didn't stop there. He closed the box and said, just like how all these bodies have name, this body also has a name, HMT, Human Mind Time, he said. HMT, Human Mind Time. And then came the master stroke. Not just that this box like you has a name, but just like how all of you students are wearing white, this box also wears a white dress, he said, and he put it into this box and said, this is a Sai devotee, a Sai student, you see? So, look at how he plays with things that are so simple and mundane to teach us the highest vision. So, the association change is basically this, that is, we must learn to dissociate the amount of attention we give to the physical, but we must give necessary attention, but not beyond we must give necessary attention to the mind, but not beyond. But we must learn to give all our attention to the spiritual core, which is our heart, in which Swami Himself resides. That is association change. You see? So, here is a practice that we will do that will help us. Because now what is happening is, the attention that we are giving to the body, which is the Annamaya Kosha. Annamaya Kosha means the food sheet. Food nourishes and therefore the body grows. Is there doubt in this? Do you have a doubt in this? No, right? So it's called the food sheet. This body is called the food sheet because it grows with food and therefore it's called Annamaya Kosha or the physical sheet, right? Then you have 
with prana maya kosha prana means breath you are breathing it's because you are breathing you are alive right and the prana is not just the breath that you breath that you take in there are five types of life breaths that function through the body they actually handle all the functions of the body these five life breaths that are there they form they are of the nature of air in us vayu and they form the prana maya kosha or the life breath sheath the third is the sheath of thoughts that we have we have so many thoughts moving around that is the mano maya kosha that is the mind sheath mental sheath then we have the sheath of the intellect which is vijnana maya kosha when it is pure the intellect functions with wisdom and therefore sometimes it's also called as the wisdom sheath but it's the intellectual sheath right and then finally what you experience in the deep sleep is pure bliss right you get up from deep sleep and say ha ah, how wonderful that was that is the ananda maya kosha now kosha means container kosha means container container cannot be divine because divine is not contained divine is boundless you see so even ananda maya kosha is where you experience the bliss but it is only a container that we must remember okay so here is a way in which you can purify these sheets in us the physical body and the mind which has three layers that is the pranamaya manomaya vijnanamaya and finally the causal body which has the anandamaya right the bliss sheet so we have to purify all of this so that the sun can shine through without any hindrance to us how do we do this swami gives a very simple method gayatri he says when you chant gayatri you can purify each one of us gayatri has got five phases right you have seen gayatri in prashanti nilayam beautiful right so mother has got five phases in 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 the idol of the mother there are five phases why because the gayatri mantra has got five phases so the first phase of gayatri is om the second phase of gayatri is bhur bhuvasva third phase is tat savitur varenyam fourth bhargo devasya dhimahi fifth dhiyo yona prachodaya so we use these each phase of mother gayatri to cleanse each of the sheets in us shall we and once you learn this you can do it every day okay and the, there are colors that are represented here for each of the sheet the food sheet is in green then you have the life breath sheet which is white the mind sheet which is pink then you have the intellect sheet which is blue and finally you have the bliss sheet which is like jyoti light but slightly yellowish okay you will find similar colors being used here today in the gamification as well okay if we say we are worshiping mother gayatri as saraswati by chanting the gayatri mantra but if we utter harsh words words that hurt other people we are actually reviling mother saraswati herself we are desecrating mother saraswati herself because the original nature of mother saraswati is our speech this is how she is present in this universe so if our speech is not pure if our speech is not loving if our speech is not compassionate then we are not worshiping mother saraswati you can have an idol of mother saraswati and do all the pujas yet the grace cannot be earned why because her real nature is that of speech and therefore swami says we must give up talking ill of others we must stop reviling or ridiculing them you see it's important to do this the second thing swami says is evil traits like these lead to the loss of peace in society when you talk harshly about somebody and they get to know what happens there's friction that friction leads to loss of peace in the community you see and then people should develop friendly and loving attitude towards their fellow beings in the society to develop a sense of helpfulness there should be the spirit of sacrifice people should also cultivate the feeling of sympathy and understanding this is swami's expectation of how we must associate ourselves in the society see this is association change in the outer we saw the inner which is how which is the practice of the gayatri but the worship of gayatri is incomplete if you don't do the outer you see and why is saraswati vaak devi you see without air 
movement of air can you create sound like just try open your mouth everybody small exercise open your mouth don't allow air to move make sound try yeah now make sound open your mouth make sound normally and see if air is moving or not by putting your hand in front uh, do it do it uh, do you feel air on your hand means it is the air or the breath that is carrying the sound now this breath is called so hum you know but if you start with the outer breath what is it hum so hum so hum hum so hum hum so hum hum so hum right that is why this is also called the so hum is called hamsa gayatri hamsa hamsa means the swan that knows to discriminate milk and water right it is the highest symbol of discrimination the buddhi so so hum means hamsa gayatri and you know what swami says because the breath says so hum the sound travels with the breath that is the air you saw it just now you experienced it just now the sound that travels with the breath is saraswati herself and therefore in your bhajan you sing hum savahini vidyadayini vedamata shri sai bhagavati why because hum savahini she rides on hamsa what is the hamsa she is sound which comes as words that rides on the breath and therefore it's hamsa vahini this is the real saraswati the original saraswati so if you worship gayatri but you desecrate her through words you think it's complete and therefore association change has to happen inside out in this way so this is a very important thing and as we did in the will the first stage of individual change we will do a little thing for association change as well the next level of affirmation that swami has given this has tremendous power and i can tell you this from my own personal experience what is here has tremendous power so if you feel like make use of this simple affirmation breathe out you are used to this now so you can do it please start breathe out i am not different from god breathe in i am god breathe out i am not different from god breathe in i am god we'll give you the slides breathe out i am not different from god breathe in i am god breathe out i am not different from god breathe in i am god please do it breathe out i am not different from god breathe in i am god. those of you are holding yourself just leave your hands loose be relaxed fully breathe in i am god breathe out i am not different from god breathe in i am god breathe out i am not different from god breathe in i am god breathe out i am not different from god breathe in i am god and remain in this affirmation if your mind is moving slowly repeat within your mind i am god i am god the next <coughs> affirmation you see here like in this we are doing in association inside and outside first you are affirming yourself that you are god yeah now you have to affirm that others are also god because with your eyes open you see everybody eyes closed you see only within yourself eyes open everybody else now if you say only i am god others are not then that that's problematic right that's not true as well. and therefore you need to affirm that others are also god this is a beautiful prayer it worked like magic so i was swami's hostel teacher at one point and you know children are children they will do something or the other and i had to take because swami loved discipline discipline is very important for swami so in order to inculcate discipline we had to take some steps so as a result you know a disciplinarian is never popular many of your parents you know that 
So I became extremely unpopular in the hostel because it was my duty to implement, that was my area of work and therefore I had to implement the discipline. The entire hostel, all the students knew that this fellow is the one, right? So you can imagine the looks that the student would give. Every time they pass, they will look at you like that and you know what's going on in their mind. So that started bearing heavily on me. I am doing my duty, but then this is not what I am expecting. So it's very heavy and this happens to everybody, right? So one thing that worked for me and therefore I am sharing with you this, is the outer affirmation of this. That is, what I started doing is, whoever student I would see, I may not even communicate with them, I am going somewhere, they are going somewhere, but they cross my path, right? Whomever the eyes would see, I would quickly tell this prayer to them, for them rather. What would that be? May your heart be open to the truth that you are God. What do you affirm just now? You are God. You are not different from God. And with all my heart, I wish you, may your life be filled with loads of joy, love and laughter. Right? Genuinely, this feeling must be there. So you look at somebody. So we do this exercise. Just turn and look at the person next to you. <laughs> okay? And I tell this and feel this really when you say this. Look at them, please do this exercise, the back benchers. You need to experience this. If you don't experience, it won't work. Yeah, just look at anybody. Yeah, next to you. Great, great. Okay? Now, in your mind, think this. May your heart be open to the truth that you are God. You are not different from God. May your life bless them. Bless them. May your life be filled with loads of joy, love and laughter. You see the difference this can make? When you do this internally, you don't have to actually tell them. You just feel this for others. Whomever you see, they may be absolute strangers. You feel for them. You know what happened? I started doing this within a week's time. There were boys coming into my room and thanking me and I don't even know that boy. Because there are 500 students in the hostel. They are coming into my room and thanking me. They just say, thank you brother. I say, for what? Thank you brother. <laughs> and I don't know that brother. Means I have not met him in the hostel. He must be in some other class which I am not taking. Right? So, this happened. So, this is the power of this affirmation. So, you do it first, but for this first you have to affirm yourself, saying, I am God, I am not different from God. Then you say, may your heart be open to the truth. Why? Because it is their choice. So, you say, may your heart be open to the truth, that you are God, you are not different from God. And I wish you from my heart, may your life be filled with loads of joy, love and laughter. Actually, bless them. You see, this will bring association change. This will bring change in the community that you live in. And many times, there are magical ways to implement this. If your boss is not working out well for you, not only you pray to your boss, silently you go. I don't know if it's illegal here. I'm yet to get conversant with the laws here. But then, you can go and just hold their chair. Hold their chair and say this. May your heart be open to the truth. That you are God. You are not different from God. May your life be filled with loads of joy, love and laughter. Do it genuinely and see the transformation. Do it every day. Especially people who trouble you. People you trouble. <laughs> All of them. Finally, we come to spiritual change. Right? And what is spiritual change? Swami says that the basis of all the three changes, the threefold transformation, is love. And that is what in a sense you practice just now. To be unconditional towards everybody. Right? This love is the undercurrent of transformation at all the levels, individual, association and spiritual. So, how does this happen? This love has to be experienced by one another, not just thought about, experienced. Then this, what you did just now is one way to expand that experience of love. Okay? This is a beautiful story that Swami would narrate. Once Krishna and Arjuna were on the banks of a river and Arjuna asked Krishna, Lord, how should a devotee be? How many of you are devotees of Swami? I am not talking about the, the absoluteness of it. I am just asking, how many of you are devotees of Swami? Just raise your hand. 
Yeah, great. So, is this question pertinent to us? Arjuna asks me. And you know what Krishna does? He tells Arjuna, Arjuna, go to the river and bring a rock out of it. And he brings a rock. He tells, okay, keep it outside in the sun for some time. And Krishna was talking to, with Arjuna about something else. After a while, he pointed to the rock and he said, See Arjuna, what has happened to the rock? Arjuna said, the rock has become completely dry in hot sun. The water has evaporated. Krishna pointed to that and said, See, this rock was in the river for hundreds of years. Hundreds of years. And yet, when it was taken out of the river, what happened to it? It became dry. Means nothing of the river got into the rock. He said, break this rock. He broke the rock. Inside, it is stark dry. And then Krishna says, this is not how a devotee should be. You see, neti. This is not how a devotee should be. Then Krishna goes and you know, he's wearing these beautiful robes and these long shawls that they would wear, the Indian kings and Krishna was also wearing one. He went, it's made of like cotton, like material and he goes and he dips it into the water. And he says, see Arjuna. Now when you dip cotton into water, it retains water for a longer period than the stone. The stone that's come out evaporates more quickly. But the cotton is holding the water for a little longer. Though its association with water was only for a few seconds or minutes, right? But then Krishna squeezed that out. Means when difficult situations happen in life, slowly the water is squeezed out. And then you leave it for dry in the sun, it's gone. Krishna said, a devotee should not be like this. <laughs> okay? And then Krishna asked Arjuna to get powdered sugar. Powdered sugar. And he takes a fistful, gives it to Arjuna and says, now you put it into the water. Arjuna puts it into the water. And then Krishna asks, now tell me where is this sugar? And then Arjuna says, Lord, it has dissolved in the water. It has dissolved in the water. And then Krishna says, a devotee must be sweet like this, who is willing to dissolve in the waters of divinity.